Wonder. Bear. We called the puppy Bear because when mom first saw him, she said he looked like a little cub bear. I said, that's what we should call him. And everyone agreed that that was the perfect name. I took the next day off from school, not because my elbow was hurting me, which it was, but so I could play with Bear all day long. Mom let Via stay home too, so the two of us took turns cuddling with Bear and playing tug of war with him. We had kept all of Daisy's old toys and we brought them out now to see which ones he'd like best. It was fun hanging out with Via all day, just the two of us. It was like old times before I started going to school. Back then, I couldn't wait for her to come home from school so she could play with me before starting her homework. Now that we're older, though, and I'm going to school and have friends of my own that I hang out with, we never do that anymore. So it was nice hanging out with her, laughing and playing. I think she liked it, too. The shift. When I went back to school the next day, the first thing I noticed, there was a big shift in the way things were. A monumental shift. A seismic shift. Maybe even a cosmic shift. Whatever you want to call it, it was a big shift. Everyone, not just in our grade, but every grade, had heard about what had happened to us with the seventh graders, so suddenly I wasn't known for what I'd always been known for, but for this other thing that had happened, and the story of what happened had gotten bigger and bigger. Two days later, the way the story went was that Amos had gotten into a fight with the kid, and Miles and Henry and Jack had gotten a fight too, and the escape across the field became this whole adventure through a corn maze and into the dark woods. Jack's version of the story was probably the best because he's so funny. But in a, whatever version of the story, no matter who was telling it, two things stayed the same. I got picked on because of my face, and Jack defended me, and those guys, Amos, Henry, and Miles, protected me. And now that they protected me, I was different to them. And it was like I was one of them. They all called me Little Dude now, even the jocks. These big dudes I barely knew before wouldn't even give me the time of day. Another thing to come out of it was that Amos became super popular and Julian, because he missed the whole thing, was out of the loop. Miles and Henry were hanging out with Amos all the time, like they switched best friends. I'd like to be able to say that Julian started treating me better too, but that wouldn't be true. He still gave me dirty looks across the room. He still never talked to me or Jack, but he was the only one who was like that, and me and Jack couldn't care less. Ducks. The day before the last day of school, Mr. Tushman called me into his office to tell me they had found out the names of the seventh graders from the nature retreat. He read off a bunch of names that I didn't mean anything to me, and then he said the last name, Edward Johnson. I nodded. You recognize the name, he said? They call him Eddie. Right, well, they found this in Edward's locker. He handed me what was left of my hearing aid headband. The right piece was completely gone and the left was mangled. The band that connected the two, the lobot part, was bent in the middle. His school wants to know if you want to press charges, said Mr. Tushman. I looked at my hearing aid. No, I don't think so, I shrugged. I'm being fitted for a new one. Hmm, why don't you talk to your parents about it? I'll call your mom and ask her about it. Augie, why don't you sit down a second, he said. I sat down. All the things on his desk were the same as when I first walked into his office last summer. The same mirrored cube, the same little globe floating in the air. That felt like ages ago. Hard to believe this year is almost over, huh? He said, almost like he was reading my mind. Yeah. Has it been a good year for you, Augie? Has it been okay? Yeah, it's been good, I nodded. I know academically it's been a great year for you. You're one of our top students. Congrats on the high honor roll. Yeah, thanks. That's cool. But I know it's had its share of up and downs, he said, raising his eyebrows. Certainly that night at the nature reserve was one of the low points. Yeah, I nodded. But it was also kind of good, too. In what way? Well, you know how people stood up for me and stuff? That was pretty wonderful, he said, smiling. Yeah. I know in school things get a little hairy with Julian at times. I have to admit, he surprised me with that one. You know about that stuff, I asked him. Directors have a way of knowing a lot about stuff. Do you have, like, secret security cameras in the hallways, I joked, and microphones everywhere? He laughed. No, seriously. He laughed again. No, not seriously. Oh, but the teachers know more than kids think, Augie. I wish you and Jack had come to me about the notes that were left in your locker. How do you know about that? I asked. I'm telling you, middle school directors know all. It wasn't a big deal, I answered, and we wrote notes too. He smiled. I don't know if it's public yet, he said, though it will be soon anyway, but Julian is not coming back to Beecher Prep this year. What? 
I said. I honestly couldn't hide how surprised I was. His parents don't think Beecher Prep is a good fit for him, Mr. Cushman. Tushman continued, raising his shoulders. Wow, that's big news, I said. Yeah, I thought you should know. Then suddenly I noticed the pumpkin portrait that used to be behind his desk was gone, and now my drawing, my self-portrait as an animal that I drew for the New Year art show, was framed and hanging behind his desk. Hey, that's mine, I pointed. Mr. Tushman turned around like he didn't know what I was talking about. Oh, that's right, he said, tapping his forehead. I've been meaning to show you this for months now. My self-portrait as a duck, I nodded. I love this piece, Augie, he said. When your art teacher showed it to me, I asked her if I could keep it for my wall. I hope that's okay with you. He, oh yeah, sure. What happened to the pumpkin? Right behind you. Oh yeah, nice. I've been meaning to ask you since I hung this up, he said. Why did you choose to represent yourself as a duck? What do you mean, I answered. That was the assignment. Yes, but why a duck, he said. Is it safe to assume that it was because of the story of mm, the duckling that turns into a swan? No, I laughed, shaking my head. It's because I think I look like a duck. Oh, said Mr. Tushman, his eyes opening wide. He started laughing. Really? Huh. Here I was looking for symbolism and metaphors, and um, sometimes a duck is just a duck. Yeah, I guess, I said, not quite getting what, why he thought that was so funny. He laughed to himself for a good 30 seconds. Anyway, Augie, thanks for chatting with me, he said. Finally, I want you to know it's truly a pleasure having you here at Beecher Prep, and I really look forward to seeing you next year. He reached across the de desk, and we shook hands. See you tomorrow, graduation. See you tomorrow, Mr. Tushman. The last precept. This was written on Mr. Brown's chalkboard when we walked into English class for the last time. Mr. Brown's precept, June. Just follow the day and reach for the sun. The polyphonic sphere. Have a great summer vacation, class 5B. It's been a great year and you've been a wonderful group of students. If you remember, please send me a postcard this summer with your personal precept. It can be something you made up yourself or something you've read somewhere that means something to you. If so, don't forget the attribution, please. I really look forward to getting them. Tom Brown, 563 Sebastian Place, Bronx, New York, 10053. <clears throat> the drop-off. The graduation ceremony was held at the Beecher Prep Upper School Auditorium. It was only about a 15-minute walk from our house to the other campus building, but Dad drove me because I was all dressed up and had on shiny black shoes that weren't broken in yet, and I didn't want my feet to hurt. Students were supposed to arrive at the auditorium an hour before the ceremony started, but we got there even earlier, so we sat in the car and waited. Dad turned on the CD player and our favorite song came on. We both smiled and started bobbing our heads to the music. Dad sang along with the song. Andy would bicycle across town in the rain to bring you candy. Hey, is my tie on straight, I said. He looked and straightened it a bit as he kept on singing, and John would buy the gown for you to wear to the prom. Does my hair look okay, I said. He smiled and nodded. Perfect, he said. You look great, Augie. Via put some gel in it this morning, I said, putting down the sun visor and looking in the mirror. It doesn't look too puffy. No, it's very, very cool, Augie. I don't think you've ever had it this short before, have you? No, I got a cut yesterday. I think it makes me look more grown up, don't you? Definitely. He was smiling, looking at me and nodding. But I'm the luckiest guy in the Lower East Side because I got wheels. Look at you, Augie, he said, smiling from ear to ear. Look at you. Looking so grown up and spiffy. I can't believe you're graduating from fifth grade. I know, it's pretty awesome, right? I nodded. Feels like just yesterday you started. Remember I still had that Star Wars braid hanging from the back of my head? Oh, that's right, he said, rubbing his palm over his forehead. You hated that braid, didn't you, Dad? Hate is a strong word, but I didn't love it. You hated it. Come on, admit it, I teased. No, I didn't hate it, he smiled, shaking his head. But I will admit to hating that astronaut helmet you used to wear. Do you remember? The one Miranda gave me? Of course I remember. I used to wear that all the time. Oh, I hated that, he laughed, almost more to himself. I was so bummed when I lost it, I said. Oh, it didn't get lost, he answered. I threw it out. Wait, what? I said. I honestly didn't think I heard him right. The day is beautiful and so are you, he was singing. Dad, I said, turning down the volume. What, he said. You threw it out? He finally looked at my face and saw how mad I was. I couldn't believe he was being so matter of fact about the whole thing. I mean, to me, this was a major revelation and he was acting like it was no big deal. Augie, I couldn't stand seeing that thing over your face anymore, he said clumsily. 
Dad, I loved that helmet. It meant a lot to me. I was bummed beyond belief when I lost it. Don't you remember? Of course I remember, Augie, he said softly. Oh, Augie, don't be mad. I'm sorry. I just couldn't stand seeing you wear that thing on your head. You know, I didn't think it was good for you. He was trying to look at me in the eye, but I wouldn't look at him. Come on, Augie, please try to understand, he continued, putting his hand under my chin and tilting my face towards him. You are wearing that helmet all the time, and the real, real, real truth is, I miss seeing your face, Augie. I know you don't always love it, but you have to understand, I love it. And I love this face of yours, Augie, completely and passionately, and kind of broke my heart that you were always covering it up. He was squinting at me like he really wanted to understand. Does mom know, I said. He opened his eyes wide. No way. Are you kidding? She tore that place apart looking for that helmet, Dad. I said, I mean, she spent like a week looking for it in every closet, in the laundry room, everywhere. I know, he said, nodding. And then he looked at me. Something about his expression made me start laughing, which made him open his mouth wide like he just realized something. Wait a minute, Augie, he said, pointing his finger at me. You have to promise me you will never tell Mommy anything about this. I smiled and rubbed my palms together like I was about to get very greedy. Let's see, I said, stroking my chin. I'll be wanting that Xbox when it comes out, and I'll definitely be wanting my own car in six years. A red Porsche would be nice, and he started laughing. I love it when I'm the one who makes Dad laugh, since he's usually the funny man that gets everybody else laughing. Oh boy, oh boy, he said, shaking his head. You really have grown up. The part of the song we used to love to sing the most started to play, and I turned up the volume. We both started singing. I'm the ugliest guy on the Lower East Side, but I've got wheels. And you could go for a ride. Want to go for a ride? Want to go for a ride? We always sang this last part at the top of our lungs, trying to hold that last note as long as the guy who sang the song, which always made us crack up. While we were laughing, we noticed Jack had arrived and was walking over to our car. I started to get out. Hold on, said Dad. Just want to make sure you've forgiven me, okay? Yes, I forgive you. He looked at me gratefully. Thank you. But don't ever throw anything else of mine out again without telling me. I promise. I opened the door and got out just as Jack reached the car. Hey, Jack, he said. Hey, Augie. Hey, Mr. Pullman, said Jack. How you doing, Jack, said Dad. See you later, Dad, I said, closing the door. Good luck, guys, Dad called out, rolling down the front window. See you on the other side of fifth grade. We waved as he turned on the ignition and started to pull away, but then I ran over and he stopped the car. I put my head in the window so Jack wouldn't hear anything I was saying. Can you guys not kiss me a lot after graduation, I asked. It's kind of embarrassing. I'll try my best. Tell mom too. I don't think she'll be able to resist, Augie, but I'll pass it along. Bye, dear old dad. He smiled. Bye, my son, my son.